The true story of Fatima. The date of the third apparition was approaching. Jacinta and Francisco were the happiest children in the world. Lucia's heart, however, was filled with gloom and despair, so much so that she made up her mind not to go to the Cova de Iria again. So often did her mother repeat the words of the pastor that it was the work of the devil, that it upset her. One day, the pastor was talking to Jos Alves, one of the first to believe in the apparitions. It is the invention of the devil, the priest said. Not at all, Father, Alves spoke up, there is praying at the Cova de Iria, and the devil does not like that. The devil even goes to the communion rail, countered the priest. You have studied, Father, I have not. The man would not argue with the pastor. The eve of the thirteenth, Lucia went to Jacinta and Francisco and told them of her decision not to go to the cova the next day. We are going. They answered her. The lady told us to go there. I will speak to her, Jacinta declared, breaking into tears. Why are you crying? Lucia asked. Because you don't want to go. No, I am not going. Look, if the lady asks for me, Tell her I am not going because I fear she is the devil. And then Lucia, grief-stricken, hurried away. The people were already gathering for the apparition of the next day, and she wanted to hide herself from them. In the evening, her mother, thinking that Lucia had been out playing all the time, scolded her. What a little wooden saint you are, eaten up with termites. Every minute you have away from the sheep you spend playing and no one can find you. The morning of July 13th came and Lucia felt the same doubt and confusion. By some strange impulse, however, when it was time to leave for the cova, every doubt and fear disappeared. Her heart was transformed. Joyfully she went to her cousin's house to see if they had gone. They were still there, both of them, kneeling by the side of the bed, crying their eyes out. Aren't you going? Lucia asked. Without you we didn't dare go, they said. But realizing that Lucia had changed her mind, they jumped to their feet. Let's go, they said together. I was on my way now, Lucia responded. So off they went, the three of them, walking happily through the crowds of people that jammed the roads to the cova. The three children could not hurry, because many people stopped them, asking them to speak to Our Lady and ask special favors for them. Jacinta's mother, seeing all the people going towards the cova, was afraid. She went to Lucia's mother, Comadre, when she pleaded, We must go to the cova too. We may never again see our children. What if they kill them? Don't worry, Lucia's mother responded. If it is Our Lady who appears to them, she will defend them. If it is not, then I don't know what might happen. Together, the two mothers went to the cova, each carrying a blessed candle which they intended to light in case it was something evil. When they reached the place, they crouched behind the bushes, their hearts pounding in expectation of some approaching evil. T. Marto was thoroughly convinced of the truth of the apparitions. He knew well that the accusations made against himself, Lucia's parents, and the priests were false. The children were never known to lie and received encouragement from no one. The pastor even supposed the visions were the work of the devil. T. Marto made up his mind to follow his children boldly to the Cova de Iria. With these thoughts in mind, he confessed, I took to the road. How crowded it was! I could not catch sight of the children but from the knots of people stopping now and then and gathering together, I guessed they were going ahead. In a sense this suited me better. However, when I got to the Cova de Iria, I could not keep myself back anymore. I wanted to be the closest one to the children. But how? I could not break through for the great crush of people. At a certain point, two men, one from Ramala and the other from our village, made a circle around the children. When they happened to see me, they pulled my arm and shouted, Here is their father. Come right in here. And so I was able to stand very close to my Jacinta. Lucia knelt a little ahead and was leading the rosary, which we all answered aloud. When the rosary was over, Lucia stood up, looked towards the east and cried out, Close the umbrellas, close the umbrellas. Our Lady is coming. Looking closely, I saw something like a small grayish cloud hovering over the home oak. The sun turned hazy and a refreshing breeze began to blow. It did not seem that we were then at the height of summer. The silence of the crowd was impressive. Then I began to hear a hum as of a gadfly within an empty jug, but did not hear a word. 
It seems to me that it must have been as when people speak on the phone, not that I have ever used a phone. To me, all this was great proof of the miracle. Many years later, Lucia gave the details of this extraordinary apparition. With the unbounded love of a mother bending over her sick child, wishing to strengthen and console the children in the truth of the apparitions, the beautiful lady engulfed the three in her immense light and rested her loving eyes on Lucia. The girl could not speak for joy. Jacinta prodded her, Lucia, go ahead, speak to her. She is already speaking to you. So Lucia, looking up towards Our Lady, her eyes filled with loving devotion, asked, What do you want of me? I want you to return here on the thirteenth of next month, the lady said. Continue to say the rosary every day in honor of Our Lady of the Rosary to obtain peace for the world and the end of the war, for only she can help you. Lucia, thinking of her mother and the words of the pastor, wishing to clear up the doubts of people, spoke again in her own childish manner. Will you please tell us who you are and perform a miracle so that everyone will believe that you really appear to us? Continue to come here every month. In October, I will say who I am and what I desire and I will perform a miracle all shall see, so that they believe. Then Lucia spoke of the petitions of the people. Our Lady answered, Some I will cure and others not. As to the crippled boy, I will not cure him or take him out of his poverty but he must say the rosary every day with his family. Lucia told her of the case of a sick person who wished to be taken soon to heaven. He should not try to hurry things. I know well when I shall come for him. Lucia asked for the conversion of some people. The answer of the lady was, as with the crippled boy, the recitation of the rosary. Then, to remind the children of their special vocation and to inspire them to greater fervor and courage for the future, the lady said, Sacrifice yourselves for sinners, and say often, especially when you make some sacrifice, O my Jesus, it is for love of thee, for the conversion of sinners and in reparation for sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary the First offer this sacrifice to thee. As Our Lady said these words, Lucia later described the scenes, she opened her hands again as she had done the two previous months. The light reflecting from them seemed to penetrate into the earth and we saw as if into a sea of fire, and immersed in that fire were devils and souls with human form, as if they were transparent black or bronze embers floating in the fire and swayed by the flames that issued from within themselves along with great clouds of smoke, falling upon every side just like the falling of sparks in great fires, without weight or equilibrium, amidst wailing and cries of pain and despair that horrified, and shook us with terror. We could distinguish the devils by their horrible and repulsive figures of frightful and unknown animals, but transparent as the black coals in a fire. Frightened deathly pale, the little ones raised their eyes to Our Lady for help as Lucia cried out, Oh! Our Lady! Our Lady explained, You have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them God wills to establish throughout the world the devotion to my Immaculate Heart. If people will do what I tell you, Many souls will be saved, and there will be peace. The war is going to end. But if they do not stop offending God, another and worse war will break out in the reign of Pius XI. When you see a night illumined by an unknown light, know that it is the great sign that God gives you that He is going to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, hunger, persecution of the Church and of the Holy Father. To forestall this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. If they heed my requests, Russia will be converted, and there will be peace. If not, she shall spread her errors throughout the world, promoting wars and persecutions of the Church. The good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer, various nations will be annihilated. In the end, my Immaculate Heart shall triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, which will be converted, and some time of peace will be given to the world. In Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, etc. Do not tell this to anyone. To Francisco, yes, you may tell it. Lucia, her heart aching to do something heroic for her lady, once again said to her, in childlike abandon, Don't you want anything else from me? No, today I desire nothing else from you. At this point something like thunder was heard, and a little arch that had been set up to hold vigil lanterns shook as if there had been an earthquake. 
Lucia rose, turning around so fast that her skirt flared. There she goes, she shouted, pointing up to heaven. There she goes. Then a few moments later, she's gone. The small, grayish cloud vanished, and as soon as the children recovered from their profound emotion, a ruthless, inquisitive crowd surrounded them, all saying at once, Lucia, what did the lady say to make you look so sad? It is a secret, she responded. Is it something good? For some it is good, for others it is evil. Won't you tell it? They pressed. No, I cannot tell it, she answered with convincing determination. The people kept pushing so much that they almost smothered the children. Jacinta's father, frightened for the safety of his children, perspiration rolling down his face from the excitement of the occasion, elbowed his way close to the children, picked up Jacinta in his strong arms and, sheltering her from the sun with his hat, started for the road home. The two mothers, still hiding behind the bushes, felt all strength gone from them. When they saw the crowd milling around their children, Jacinta's mother cried out, Oh, good mother, they are killing our children. How relieved both were a few moments later to see Jacinta on the shoulders of her father, Francisco in the arms of a relative, and Lucia being carried by a very tall man, so tall in fact that Lucia's mother was distracted from her worry. Oh, what a big man, she blurted out. After this third apparition of Our Lady, the three children yearned more and more to be left alone to say their prayers and make their sacrifices for Our Lady. But whenever they were seen on the streets, the crowds of people gathered to ask them all sorts of questions about the apparitions. To avoid these questioners, they had to wend their way to their pastures over back roads and deserted lanes. So filled were they with the thought of pleasing the lady that nothing else counted, either singing nor dancing, not even the flute playing of little Francisco. What are you thinking about, Jacinta? Lucia asked one morning, noticing a cloud of sadness veiling her face. I am thinking of hell, and poor sinners. How sorry I am for the souls that go to hell, the people there, alive, burning like wood in a fire. Lucia, why is it that Our Lady does not show hell to sinners? If they saw it, they would not commit any more sins, and then they would not go there. Lucia, puzzled, could find no word to answer. But Jacinta insisted, Why did you not tell Our Lady to show hell to all those people? I forgot, Lucia admitted. Jacinta then knelt on the ground, while she raised her folded hands towards heaven, sighing out the prayer that the lady taught them to say, O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those most in need. Lucia and Francisco both followed suit, kneeling as they said the lattice prayer with Jacinta. Jacinta, however, was so engrossed in her prayer, she did not realize Lucia was praying with her, and she spoke up, Lucia, Francisco, are you praying with me? We must pray a great deal to save souls from hell. So many go there. The thought of hell and the soul's suffering in its fire so filled the child's mind, she could not fathom the reasons for it. As ever, she went to Lucia with all of her problems. Lucia, what have these people done to go to hell? I don't know. Maybe they sinned by missing Mass on Sunday. Maybe they said ugly words, stole, swore. And do they go to hell just for one word? If it is a big sin. How easy it would have been for them to have held their tongues or go to Mass. How sorry I am for them. If I could only show them hell. Tired and weary from kneeling so long, they got up and walked to the shade of the large home oaks to think some more on the words of their lady. Francisco spoke up this time. Why did Our Lady hold in her hand a heart, spreading upon the world that great light that is God? Lucia, you were with Our Lady in the light that came towards the earth, but Jacinta and I in the light that went up to heaven. You and Jacinta will go to heaven soon, but I have to stay in the world longer. How many years? I don't know, but for many. Was it the lady who told you? No, but I saw it in that light that she sent into our hearts. That's true, Jacinta spoke up. I also saw in that way. I am going to heaven, but you are going to stay here. If Our Lady lets you, tell everyone what hell is like, so that they won't sin any more. So many people falling into hell, so many people. You don't have to be afraid, Lucia said. You are going to heaven. Yes, I shall go but I want everybody to go there, too. The cool hours of the morning gave way to the stifling heat of the day. The children burned with thirst, 
but there was not a drop of water near. Instead of complaining, seven-year-old Jacinta seemed happy. How good it is, she said. I am thirsty, but I offer everything for the conversion of sinners. Lucia, the oldest of the three, realized that she should look after her cousins, so she went to a nearby house to fetch some water. When she returned, she offered it first to Francisco. I don't want to drink, the nine-year-old boy said. I want to suffer for sinners. Jacinta, you drink it. I also want to offer a sacrifice. So Lucia poured out the water into the hollow of a rock for the sheep to drink, and returned the empty jug to the house. Jacinta, however, became very weak and was almost fainting. The rhythmic noises of crickets, frogs, and insects began to pound in her ears like thunder. Holding her head in her hands, she cried out in utter desperation, My head aches so. Tell the crickets and frogs to stop. Don't you want to suffer this for sinners? Francisco asked. Yes, I do. Let them sing. Lucia, Jacinta continued, The lady said that her immaculate heart shall be your refuge, and the way that shall lead you to God. Doesn't that make you happy? I love her heart very much. I should like to go with you, Lucia confessed thinking of the beautiful joys of heaven. Lucia, don't you remember? The heart of Our Lady encircled by thorns? How pitiful! I am so sorry for her. She asked for the communion of reparation, but how can I do this, if I can't receive communion yet? Filled with such thoughts, the days sped by for these three children. One time, Jacinta was alone near the well, while Lucia and Francisco went to look for some wild honey. Suddenly she had a vision of the Pope. Thinking that the others would see everything she did, she called them back. Lucia. Francisco. Did you see the Holy Father? No. I don't know how it happened, Jacinta went on. I saw the Holy Father in a very big house. He was kneeling before a table, holding his face in his hands and he was crying. Outside there were many people. Some were throwing stones at him. Others were swearing at him and saying many ugly words to him. How pitiful it was! We must pray a lot for him. Another time, while they were in the cave of the cabio saying the prayer of the angel, Jacinta suddenly got up, her eyes filled with tears. Lucia, she sobbed, Don't you see all those roads and lanes and fields covered with people crying from hunger, without anything to eat? And the Holy Father in a church praying before the Immaculate Heart of Mary? And all those praying with him? As news of the apparition spread throughout the country, the number of visitors to Fatima increased daily. Some were devout, others were merely curious, but all wanted to see the Cova de Iria and to speak to the three children. Jacinta's father tells of this in his own words. Many ladies came, elaborately dressed. We might be doing our chores in our everyday clothes and they embarrassed us very much. Oh, but were they curious, very, very curious. They were all after the secret. They sat Jacinta on their lap and plagued her with questions. But she answered only when it suited her. They petted her, offered her presents, but all in vain. It was a secret that could not be extracted, even with a corkscrew. Some well-dressed gentlemen came only to laugh and make fun of us, who did not even know how to read. Very often we were the ones who laughed last. Poor things. They had no faith. How could they believe in Our Lady? The children seemed to sense this type of person, and they would vanish in the wink of an eye. Once a car stopped at the door, and a large family got out. The three children scattered over the house. Lucia hid under the bed, Francisco climbed to the attic, but Jacinta, who was not so nimble, was caught. When the visitors left, Lucia came out from under the bed and said to Jacinta, What did you say when they asked for me? I kept very quiet. I knew where you were, but lying is a sin. They laughed and joked about it, their playing hide and seek with the visitors. What questions the people asked? Timardo continued, Did Our Lady also have goats and sheep? Did she eat potatoes? Such foolishness. The priests were no less inquisitive. They would ask us questions, Lucia said, then they would ask the same questions all over again. As soon as we saw a priest, if we could, we ran away. Every time we found ourselves before a priest, we prepared ourselves to offer to God one of our biggest sacrifices. There were some exceptions among the priests, 
one was a source of great joy and encouragement to the children. My dear girl, Lucia remembers this priest saying to her, You should love God a great deal for the favors and graces He is giving you. These words, said with such great kindness, engraved themselves so deeply on her heart, that since then she made it a habit to say continually to our Lord, My God, I love you, in gratitude for the graces you have given me. Lucia taught this prayer to her cousins. Jacinta loved it so much, that no matter what they were doing, she might interrupt everything to say to Lucia, Lucia, have you forgotten to tell our Lord that you love him for the graces he has given us? There was another saintly old priest, a Father Cruz, a priest still venerated by all the people, who helped the children very much. One day, he went to Aljustral and requested the children to take him to the place where Our Lady appeared to them. Astride his donkey, flanked by the two girls, he rode over to the Cova de Iria, all the way teaching the girls new prayers. Jacinta remembered two of them, which she frequently said, and which gave her great consolation during her illness. My God, I love you, and sweetheart of Mary, be my salvation. Explaining why she remembered these prayers, she said, I want to tell Jesus that I love him so much. When I say this to him, it seems that I have a fire in my heart. I love our Lord and Our Lady so much that I never get tired of telling them that I love them. The Marto family was much more understanding of Jacinta and Francisco than was Lucia's family of her. They questioned Lucia and ridiculed her even more than outsiders. Her mother nagged her continually and went so far as to punish her. If we cannot excuse Senora dos Santos, we can try to understand the mother's reasons for this course of action. They were a family of ordinary means. They had only a few head of cattle and a few pieces of land in the Cova de Iria where they raised their vegetables and food potatoes, corn, beans, and olives. Since the apparitions, so many people came to visit the Cova de Iria that the vegetables were trampled upon and everything was ruined. My mother, lamenting her loss, would not spare me, Lucia said. When you want to eat, you can go now and ask that lady. And my sisters would say, you should eat only what grows in the Cova de Iria. This nagging became so distressing to the child, she hardly dared to pick up a slice of bread to eat. To make things worse, her older sisters who used to weave and sew to help support the home, now had to help tend the sheep and they lost so much time with visitors, they could not do their work. Finally the family had to sell the sheep. Lucia's life at home grew more unbearable every day. Misunderstanding and misinterpretations multiplied with the hours. Her oldest sister, Maria dos Anjos, recalled, One day, an old lady came to mother and told her that she was not surprised any more at the children saying that they had seen Our Lady. She had seen a lady give Lucia half a dollar. Mother immediately called Lucia and asked if that were true. Lucia said that she had been given only two pennies. Mother persisted, using the old lattice words against Lucia. Once a liar, always a liar, and she used the broomstick on Lucia. A few moments later Jacinta came in and showed us the half dollar given her. But it was too late for Lucia. She had already got her thrashing. Some neighbors were as bad in their unbelief. They were very mean to the little ten-year-old girl, calling her evil names and, at times, even striking the child. No one dared to strike the Marto children, however, T. Marto watched them too closely. Little Jacinta, in her eagerness to suffer for sinners, one day said to Lucia, I wish my parents were like yours so that they would hit me. Then I would have more sacrifices to offer to our Lord. Signora Marto did act rather harshly at times but only at first. You are going to get it, she would say, for you're cheating the people. Many go to the Cova de Iria just because of you. But we don't force anyone to go there, Jacinta spoke up. Whoever wants to go there goes. Whoever does not want to believe will be punished. And mother, you look out, for if you don't believe. Meanwhile, Jacinta's father was being patient, mulling over the facts, trying to arrive at the truth. Like good Saint Joseph of old, T. Mardo was not going to judge hastily or do anything rash or unjust. He was thinking and praying, waiting for God to direct his course of thought and action. Newspaper writers were not so considerate. The apparitions were reported in the papers, but the facts were placed in a wrong light. Ridiculous details were invented and scorn was heaped upon this new factory of miracles that the priests were setting up in Fatima. 
Trying to explain it away, the newspaper accounts accused the children and those who believed in them of being epileptics, the victims of fraud, greed or collective suggestions. The ridicule and accusations of the newspapers served but to divide the people, stirring up the enemies of the church on the one hand, yet also serving to stir up the faith of the believers. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of death. Amen.